think. So, um, so we've got Tulsi this morning, who's going to be talking about designing products and services. And uh, uh, Tulsi's got a long history of working on designing products uh, all over in startups and enterprises. She's going to take us through a whole bunch of different processes that we can use to actually uh, go from merely good products to really amazing ones using different tools, uh, talking about prototyping. How, does, how do you use prototyping while building products? Talking about gorilla testing, talking about usability. Um, and also looking at an extremely important part of the picture, which is how do you sell design? How do you actually make a case for design? How do you say that design is actually going to lead to an increase in uh, your investment by investing in design right now? So Tulsi uh, runs a product and design startup based in Hyderabad called Zuri Labs, which you can take a look at as well. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, maybe. Uh, let me just start this and uh, we'll get going here. Okay, so uh, my talk is called High on Design. Um, I think I was telling somebody uh, last night, I think I was high maybe when I came up with the title of the talk. Uh, but basically what I'm going to be talking about is uh, some real world examples uh, that I've learned along the way. Um, my, my life also started off in engineering very similar to Navjot who spoke yesterday. And I moved from engineering to product management into design. And I sort of ended up full circle at design now. Um, I moved with my dog Zuri to India about a month and a half ago. I used to be in the US. Um, and I just started my company called Zuri Labs. And we hope to work with nonprofits as well as smaller companies to um, help them realize their design of, uh, or their vision of having uh, innovative digital products on the internet. Um, and I'm really happy to actually be part of this wonderful network um, and be part of the digital revolution in India. Uh, some of my contact information is uh, below. so. I would love to hear from you, and even if you have any feedback, good or bad, about my talk, I would love to hear about it. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about design thinking. We won't delve too much into the processes of design thinking. We'll instead move into some real world exercises and examples that I've seen working, um, and then we'll move on to um, how to uh, empower your engineering teams, because a good design is nothing without an engineering team to help you build it. So what is design thinking and why is it so important? Uh, design thinking came up uh, from companies like IDEO as well as the design school in Stanford. Um, and you know, it's just an amazing institute and there's a lot of great work coming out of uh, there. Um, but basically, I think that design thinking gives companies this little design edge. Um, and if you look at companies that we all love, uh, you know, like I, I know many of you have Apple computers, for example. Uh, the first time I got my Apple computer many years ago, I, I read an article about the sleep light in the Apple computer. And basically, the sleep light is a white light, and it mimics human sleeping patterns. So the first night when my Apple computer was shut down and was next to the bed, um, you know, I, I looked at it and I was like, oh, my little computer is sleeping as well. And you suddenly have this fondness towards your computer. And so I think that little piece of um, design in the Apple computer made me a brand evangelist for Apple. And I'm sure all of you have a similar story about Apple or you know, your favorite brand. There was something that turned you over into just from becoming just an average user to becoming a product advocate. So I think design is that key thing that can make that happen, that kind of leap of faith um, happen. And really, you know, in, um, kind of inspires customer loyalty. 
So in terms of, you know, when you're explaining to your boss, uh, you know, why, is, why should I spend money on design, or you know, what's the return of in, on, in, on investment, just think about how like, uh, you know, well-designed products sort of sell themselves. Um, you know, you create like a network of advocates and brand evangelists that just sell the product for you. And I think that's really key and um, design can help that process. Um, so back to design thinking and why I think it's important and what is design thinking. Uh, according to Tim Brown, who's the um, head of IDEO, a really fantastic organization. If you haven't heard of it, go to their website. They have a lot of excellent content uh, that you can learn from. Um, but basically, you can read that. I'm not going to read it for you. Uh, but basically, what design thinking is, is just a different way of thinking. Um, I think many of us are already doing it, and we're just putting a label on it. Uh, but basically, what design thinking is, is empathetic thinking, putting the user in the middle of the problem instead of the problem ahead. Um, and then really, I mean, uh, you know, a single line definition of design thinking is a human approach, um, uh, human-centered approach to innovation. And so I think that's really key to um, uh, beautiful products. Put the user in front, put the user's problems in front, and really build the solution for that user, to make that user happy, to make that user more empowered and save them time or something like that. But put that user in mind, uh, in the center. So there are many, many different ways uh, that design thinking processes are defined. And while we sit and talk about process and things like that, I just want to clarify that not all processes work in all situations. So don't just blindly go back to your organization and say, yeah, you know, like I read, I saw on Meta Refresh that I need to do these six things and my company is now going to be successful. Um, I think you need to really take ideas from here and then see how it will work within your own organizations, within your own um, structures and patterns. Um, so basically, design thinking. The four key stages, I think, in the design thinking process are define, with, where you basically define the user and your, the problem. Ideate, where you throw out ideas. It's a very collaborative type of process. You don't judge during this process. There are no stupid ideas that come up from this process. I mean, there might be, but you don't judge other people's ideas. And um, I think uh, ideation is, is key to design thinking where you throw out a lot of ideas and then figure out what works. Uh, prototyping, of course, is really important, uh, where you go straight from ideation to prototyping. So put it in some form that you can then get feedback from users and get users to engage with it and give uh, feedback. I mean, again, it goes back to you know design thinking puts the user in the center. If you're not able to get feedback from the user, then you know, you're not really design thinking then you might as well just build a software product and then put it out there and figure out um, what it does. Um, and then, of course, uh, built. Software product is not a software product if it's not built. So that's obviously quite obvious. And then learn. I think um, that, that too is important, basically. Once you put the product out there, don't just think that the product is out there and my users are using it. Engage with your users. See how they are engaging with the product. Um, I think yesterday Karthik mentioned about metrics. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there that you can actually measure the metrics of how users are using the product. Uh, you know, how's the mouse moving before they actually click on that button you want them to click on and things like that. So really measure all of that. Now I think every designer or many designers' big challenge is how do they fit into the agile world? And I don't think there's any easy answer for this, unfortunately. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday where they, um, they said that in their organization, the designers are up front and center. I would love to work in an organization like that, but unfortunately, never have. Uh, so usually what happens is uh, product management and engineering set the timelines uh, for a product. And then, like many times, actually, engineering would come to me and say, hey, like we need these screens by tomorrow. And 
obviously then you don't have time for ideation and prototyping and testing and all of that. Uh, so what we did, uh, what we managed to do pretty successfully was actually get slightly ahead of the curve. Um, so we'd work with the product managers and figure out approximate timelines for when products were coming out in a sprint cycle. And then we'd work one sprint or two sprints before that. Um, and then we also became much faster and quicker about this entire process in yellow. Uh, sometimes we just do it in a day that we would, um, you know, ideate in the morning, build the prototype in the afternoon. If you have templates and things like Bootstrap and stuff, it's easy to prototype. And then we just do internal testing um, sometimes. And also, um, I mean, I, I again want to iterate, like, just because there's a process doesn't mean that you should follow it and you shouldn't become rigid about following it. There are lots of times that you can just use your gut instinct and put a feature out there. Uh, I think that's really important. Uh, if you understand your user and your market and your product, then sometimes just build it and put it out there and see what, see what the feedback is. So don't get fully stuck on um, uh, feedback. So I don't want to delve too much on theory. Uh, let's just move on to some uh, things that ha I've seen be successful and I've learned from other people along the way. Um, so the first thing is, the first stage, like we saw in that little circular diagram, is defining. So defining is, of course, key. Um, we, we, I mean, we don't even have to have this discussion if we're not working on defining. So what is that stage? So basically, that stage is where you define the user and you define the problem, and you define why solving this problem is important. So that's the stage um, of defining. So the first thing is defining your user and getting to know who your user is. Um, you know, you don't need to do something as complicated like this. Um, it has helped us in the past, especially trying to get all the engineers on the same page. Uh, a lot of times what we used to do is uh, print out these cards like really big, almost as big as that there, with the photograph of the user, what motivates them, what makes them happy, what's going to get them their next promotion, what's going to make them look good in the eyes of their boss. Um, you know, all of those sort of things. You know, do they have a dog? What's their dog's name? So really, you know, things, little things about the user where you get to know them. Um, you get to know what motivates them. You know, so basically, it's like an emotional map of your user. And that's really important. Like, it brings everyone on the same page when you're ideating as well as building the software. Uh, so like in, in our engineering office, actually, we have a whole wall uh, full of users uh, for various aspects of the product. And it's, you know, it, it really helps uh, validating uh, the product. Um, the next thing, of course, is defining the problem. Uh, of course, uh, you know, there, there wouldn't be a solution if there isn't a problem. So, um, you know, when, when you're defining the problem, it's, it's really important for the next stage that we'll talk about in a second, uh, the ideation stage, uh, to actually have a clear definition of the problem. Um, it's really important because, if, like, if you have, like, 10 people in a room that are going to be ideating and uh, kind of throwing out ideas for solving a problem, it's really important that they know what the problem is that they're trying to solve. Everyone needs to be on the same page, kind of you have equal footing uh, when they're innovating around this problem. So, I mean, this is just some examples that, or some questions that you should ask yourself when you're defining the problem. You know, is it worth solving this problem? How is the user gonna feel if you solve this problem? Are they gonna become more productive? You know, are they gonna send you a thank you note? Um, you know, it's, it's always, fabulous when you actually get a thank you note from a user saying, you know, thanks a lot, like it just saved me six hours a day because you built this thing into the product. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know, makes you know that you've done something right. Okay, so um, we're going to do like a little ideation exercise in a few minutes, uh, but before we do that, um, I want to talk about my five favorite sort of design rules um, when it comes to building user interfaces. The first one is hardcore soft periphery. Some people also refer to this as the epicenter. 
basically what that means is that one or two elements that give us give your page its purpose put that kind of in the center of the page and then build all of the other functionality around it um, and when I say center of the page I don't mean like literally center of the page but center of the focus of the user um, I'll give you an example um, recently Yahoo redid their user interface for their mail software I don't know if how many of you use Yahoo Mail um, so about a week ago, I was using Yahoo Mail, and I couldn't figure out how to compose an email message. Um, I would think that that is core to Yahoo Mail, being able to send an email message. I shouldn't have to search the whole screen for that. So that's what I mean when um, designing from the core. Uh, so keep the core central. Um, it's also very, very useful doing this uh, when we're designing for responsive web design. Because as soon as you've identified what those core elements are um, and that core functionality is to a page, then you know that on a smaller screen, a tablet, mobile, you still want to keep that core central. So it's a really, really useful uh, principle to have. The next one is the Pareto principle. It's actually, some, it's actually a concept uh, that comes from economics and sort of unrelated to design, but uh, some designers have taken this and are running with it and I think it's a useful principle it's basically the 20 80 or 80 20 principle you want to try and get the user to do 20% of the work required to achieve 80% of the result now obviously that's not always possible but it's something that would be great to strive for basically the third one I think is sort of uh, self-explanatory uh, minimize distractions um, so that's just basically if you don't need it on the screen don't put it on the screen keep it minimal keep the fonts readable get rid of gradients and you know uber rounded corners and all of that stuff um, so you know just keep it simple keep it approachable and you're probably doing a great job um, blank slates so blank slate is basically sort of the welcome mat to your software application. Um, how does the user first feel when they enter the application? Like once they've logged in, they've come into the application, how does the user feel about the application? How do they engage with the application? Um, it's not necessarily showing them a message. It could be doing something for them. Um, I'll give you like a really great example. I think uh, Pinterest um, has like a perfect blank slate uh, the first time I signed into Pinterest or got my Pinterest account, um, I was a skeptic, like most people. And I was like, do we really need another social networking for images? Um, so then I said, okay, fine, I need to sign up and see what it's all about. So I sign up for Pinterest. And as soon as I sign up, the first thing it does is um, goes and checks what my interests are and comes back and says, we think you should have these five boards. So I'm like, okay, fine, create the five boards. And then it says, we think you should follow these 10 people. I'm like, okay, I'll follow those 10 people. And all of a sudden, in the next step, my Pinterest account is set up. I'm following 10 people. They have all this exciting stuff. And in just a few minutes, I've become an addict to Pinterest because they had an awesome blank slate. They thought of the user, they thought of engaging with the user, and they thought of making adoption of the product much easier. And I think that's something that we should all keep in mind. And finally, good defaults. Sorry, was there a question? No, okay. Um, good defaults. Um, good defaults, I don't know, I think some people might think that it's not like one of the key principles. I think it's a key principle because if you actually um, think of good defaults in the product. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Zomato, like the first time I went to Zomato, it had already selected Hyderabad for me. Um, or Campaign Monitor. Uh, the first time I went to Campaign Monitor, it, it had selected my time zone, and it had gotten like a whole bunch of information about me through my Facebook account. Um, so I think the, the good thing about defaults is, if you think about the defaults, then you realize that there are at least 20 questions you don't have to ask the user 
you can answer those questions for you. And it sort of goes back to that whole, uh, you know, inspiring adoption of your software. Uh, asking the user less questions, assuming more about the user, and then personalizing based on what, um, what we assume. So now we're going to move into like a little ideation exercise. Uh, so all of you probably have a notebook. Um, this idea actually came from uh, someone at Google called Bryn Evans. And uh, it's, it's also talked about in the, in the go, go, game storming book. So definitely get it if you like this exercise. So take your, uh, take your notebook and take a piece of paper out of your notebook. So this exercise is called 685, um, which basically means six to eight ideas in five minutes. Uh, but because we don't have that much time, we're going to do a kind of shortened version of this, which is going to be four to six ideas in three minutes. So what you're going to do is fold the paper in half, and then uh, fold it in one-third. So you're going to get something that looks like this. You have uh, six quadrants, basically, in your, uh, in your paper. Um, and now get out your pencil, and I'll, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the exercise. OK. So here's the exercise. Now, um, the user is somebody called Tashi. And, um, He's a teacher by day and a foodie by night. What makes him most happy is when he's cooking for his friends and his friends can tell him what a hero he is because he's cooked such a fine meal. Um, the problem is that Tashi has invited people for dinner and he's run out of gas. Uh, he's called his regular gas company and they say that they can't deliver it for three days. So Tashi is screwed. He's not going to order pizza that's beneath him. So he needs to get gas. He needs to get gas today. So what we're going to do in three minutes is come up with an app that Tashi can use. Um, it's going to be, you know, like a local app. Um, you know, think about how local apps work. Uh, what is needed for Tashi to find the gas locally? Um, find out if it's available. How much is it going to cost? And actually um, make the order and be able to track it. Um, on this piece of paper, you're going to use one little square for each of your ideas. And the goal is to come up with six ideas for this problem in three minutes. Uh, so we'll start the clock and go ahead, uh, start brainstorming. Keep it really high. Don't think about who's going to build it, how it's going to be built. It's going to be like really a low fidelity, high, just sketch out some ideas. So go ahead and sketch. I'll, I'll tell you after when you have about a minute to go. I have a question here. Yeah. Uh, if regular gas companies cannot provide in three days, then any app will not do. Well, yeah, again, like this is all an imagined world <laughs> where there are perfect gas companies that will provide gas today. <laughs> Okay, I think we're about halfway through.
have about 20 seconds to go. Okay, I think we'll stop now. Um, so let me just try and take a poll. Like how many people actually could fill all six of those um, areas with? Excellent, we have two. How many people could fill four? Excellent. How many people filled in more little squares than they thought they could fill? Okay, good. So, you know, like I think this, hopefully this was a fun exercise to do. Um, you know, the, the idea is just to get those juices flowing in your head and it's, it's a really great exercise to do in a room with four or five people and then, and then really, um, you know, be able to um, share those ideas with people. Now, um, I think the one thing that you need to all be aware as a great designer is not every idea that you come up with is a good one. Or it might be a good one, but it just may not be a good one for that specific scenario. So the next step from this, and we're not going to do this now, but the next step of this whole exercise is either you brainstorm with those six ideas with other people, or you take those six ideas and you do a one-up. So what that means is you take, chuck out or throw away five of the bad ideas from those six, take one and kind of turn the sheet over and make that into more detail. And then you can start getting feedback on that idea. So let's move on to prototyping. Um, you know, once you have that idea, uh, like we mentioned before, you know, the user is central to this process. So I think um, I am personally a huge believer in going straight from like an idea to a prototype. Um, I no longer use Photoshop for any of the work I do because I've realized that users cannot engage with Photoshop. They don't know how that menu is going to pull down or that the button actually clicks or that there's a drop down or anything. So it's much nicer to go straight from the pro to a prototype. It's much more realistic for a user. You can get much better um, a kind of um, uh, a better feedback loop uh, that the user is in and really be able to engage with them much more realistically. Um, and especially with things like Twitter Bootstrap and other sort of frameworks like that, prototyping has become much, much easier. Uh, this specific sketch is actually from um, an interview that Dave Gray did with uh, Jason Fried. And if you haven't seen the interview, you should. It's half an hour of uh, sheer awesomeness. Um, now, of course, creating wireframes is always an alternative. I think if, if you don't have the skills to uh, do HTML, um, then definitely create uh, wireframes. But for those of you who don't do HTML and CSS and uh, think that you're designers, I think it's time to learn to do HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Don't feel so scared. It's, it's not that difficult to do. Um, yeah, so you can always do wireframes. There are lots of uh, wireframing tools out there, Flare Builder and um, OmniGraphil and Balsamic are my favorites, but there are a whole bunch of tools out there. Um, there are even some that are completely online as well. Okay, I guess the, the next important stage is testing. Um, you know, if, if you need to get feedback from your users. Um, now, when you approach your user, it's really, really important that you don't use jargon. Uh, there are a whole bunch of designers that I know who will go to the user and say, you know, this was our design process, and here's how we thought about your problem, and this is how we approached it, and blah, blah, blah. The user is not interested in any of that. Instead, when you approach the user, ask them really directed questions like, here's the page. What's the first thing you would do on this page? Or how would you go about creating this element? Um, ask them questions like that so that they give you, um, they're able to engage, and they're able to think about it. Uh, the other thing that I found very useful is actually having um, usability tests with other designers. Uh, they're able to engage with the product uh, differently, and you can actually have the designer talk you through what they are thinking as they are engaging with your prototype. Um, so that's also been very useful. Uh, you're probably wondering what gorilla testing is. 
Um, it's something that I found very useful, and it's actually fun, and actually you make friends. Uh, so lately, what I've been doing whenever I uh, design a piece of software is I'll go to like a coffee shop or something, and especially if it's a B2C type of software, um, take your prototype to a coffee shop, approach somebody who looks friendly, and tell them you'll buy a coffee, buy them a coffee if they'll engage with your product for five minutes. Uh, you get anonymous feedback, totally uh, kind of objective feedback, and it really helps you improve the product. Uh, there are also lots of uh, UX testing tools out there that allow you to do remote testing. Uh, my favorite is this thing called Intuit HQ. Uh, you can see here this was a TED, uh, the TED site being tested uh, for a redesign. Uh, so it's really straightforward, this Intuit HQ. Basically, they ask you, like, they allow you to put a screenshot of your product and then um, ask you to type in a question. Uh, in this case, you know, how would you view upcoming TED conferences? And then it tracks the mouse, um, the mouse of the user, and then gives you results uh, based on the mouse tracking and things like that. So it's a really great uh, testing tool, and it's quite affordable. Of course, there are uh, several others. Uh, and then finally, um, finally, uh, you know, you might have the best design in the world, but then if you don't have an engineering team to build it, then you know we might as well all go home, right? Um, so I think oh, the the first thing. This is also another idea that came up from the game storming book. It's called Four Cs. Uh, so what the idea here is that you get, before you're building a product, get four disparate uh, groups into a room. So in this case, uh, you might have product managers focusing on the characteristics. You might have marketing focusing on the characters. Your engineering team focusing on the components. And then, say, your ops and database team focusing on the challenges. Um, and so you get all of these four kind of groups of people in a room to write down you know, what they think uh, about this product that you're proposing. And that really empowers um, your entire company. It brings everybody on the same page as far as the product and kind of inspires everybody about the product. And it really uh, puts the engineering team in the center of the process. Um, I think so there's, uh, that's one thing. Um, you know, I, in, in there are like lots of design-centered companies where designers are in the center of the um, solution or the problem, um, or they're driving the solution basically. And in those cases, sometimes the engineers feel that you know they need to enable the designer. In a lot of companies I've been at, like the the engineer usually feels that they're the curator of the of the software and they need to protect the software, and the designer is out there to screw with their zen, basically. Um, but we're not doing that. Uh, we're all working on this together. And it's important that you, you know, build that relationship with your engineer and empower them. Uh, the other thing that also has really helped is setting up design standards and guidelines um, that engineers can follow. Uh, recently, actually, at Allegiance, we set up about six months ago, we set up uh, design guidelines. And it had everything from capitalization to colors to fonts to everything. and one day I was having coffee and I heard these three engineers fighting about um, what the capitalization should be uh, for table headers because it wasn't in the design guidelines. And I was like, yes, success. So you, know, so you can inspire your engineering teams to um, follow design guidelines and be inspired to uh, bring in um, design and design thinking into their processes. And uh, finally, you know, communicate uh, mistakes so they're not repeated. Uh, what we've done in the past that's been really successful is have like midweek design reviews where uh, the engineering team can come and show show you what they're doing. And that was really great because the engineers themselves started building kind of cool ideas into the system. Sometimes they were a bit crazy, but you know, if they're inspired, I think that's a good thing. And uh, this is my last slide. Uh, there are lots of um, tools out there to maintain uh, templates and patterns which uh, help establish the guidelines throughout your, uh, throughout your company. Um, I think one of the, my favorite is Patternry, uh, where you can save 
your favorites and go back to it and refer to it in the future. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, this is my contact information. I would love to get feedback from all of you. And I think we have about 15 minutes, right, for 10 minutes. We have about 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> yep. Uh, hi, my name is Amit. Uh, good presentation, first Thank of you. all. And uh, I myself uh, am a UX designer and have been uh, working on a lot of these things what you taught in the uh, your presentation. Uh, one thing which I uh, wanted to ask was how do you ensure visual design? If you say you don't want to like skip the Photoshop uh, part and directly jump from wireframes to HTML. And you also ask us to like learn HTML. I know HTML. Yeah. But like if I create HTML, I have those prototypes, but eventually that needs to be converted into an application. It mm -hmm. needs to go to the developer. So this is one question, and with the same question, actually, how detailed do you want to go to the wireframes? Uh, the same question I had for Navjot also yesterday, we were saying, like, uh, very crude uh, wireframes that you are creating, like paper prototypes in these starting are good for ideation and stuff, but eventually you need to communicate those things, actually elements in your page to the visual designer also. Mm -hmm. So few people actually in wireframes do go uh, like give them the background, the focus to some button so that visual designers also understand what needs to be given more focus to. Mm -hmm. So how do you ensure those things when you're advocating not to use Photoshop yeah. or skip that thing? Um, I think, well, I guess it depends on whether you're developing a new application from the start or it's, you know, some features that you're adding to an existing application, right? So let's take the scenario where you're adding features to an existing application. It's a little bit easier because you probably have a design guideline that's set and you're following a certain design guideline. And so what we've done in those scenarios is actually create our own sort of bootstrap with all of those visual design elements in, in there so that it's very easy to just take and build a form or a wizard or whatever. So that's obviously the easier way. Um, I think when you're doing a new product, what I've done actually in the past is first focus when you're doing usability tests, you don't really need to have the visual elements at all. Uh, so rather it's the layout, it's the uh, interactions and all of that. And that we've just been able to do with Bootstrap and things like that. Uh, but then we'd send that eventually, I mean, if it's a new product, I think you do need to resort to Photoshop. Um, there are actually a lot of visual designers now that are just working directly in CSS and HTML. Um, and that actually is my preference because a lot of times that thing that you build in Photoshop, when you build it in HTML, it doesn't really look the same. Or it takes like crazy amounts of effort to make it look the same. So I hope that answered your question. Yep. Hello. Cool. Um, earlier on, you had a slide which had this survey you can give users. So, like, what's your frustrations? What's your ideal experience? Now, on a lot of websites, there's like a bio description on the user profile page where they can edit their account. Have you seen any websites that actually ask those questions on that little user account page? It seems like a valuable thing to do. Yeah. No, I haven't, and I think that would be like maybe that's the next piece of software we build. Cool. Yeah. All right, sweet. It, yeah, it seems like a good idea. I'll probably yeah, try it. Cool, sweet. Hey, hey. it was really nice. Um, so, uh, design thinking. Um, since you've been practicing it for some time, I've I've come across the the term, the process for a few years now. Uh, I've also attended a couple of workshops around practicing empathy and uh, brainstorming, things like that. Um, I tend to kind of not agree with the, I'm guessing just the naming of the thing, because uh, thinking to me, uh, or, or process to me is really about automating stuff, right? It's about removing th thought so that you can keep repeating things, and given that here we've called a process design thinking, that to me sort of seems absurd as a, as, as a name. And I'm guessing that that's been one of the big reasons why I just haven't gotten into 
following some of the practices. I mean, the general ideas of practicing empathy and, and understanding and spending time with your users mm -hmm. are great, but the name itself is dangerous because a lot of people might confuse it with real deep thought and understanding rather than, you know, a process. Thoughts? What do you think? I, I agree with you. Uh, I think, like, the name itself, go have a discussion with Tim Brown. Uh, like I'm not going to live reply to that. But I do agree with you, and I think I sort of mentioned that earlier on. I mean, just because we're doing A, B, and C doesn't mean that we're building, like, awesome software, right? Um, I mean, you can always, like, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, like, if, if you know, like, awesome product managers or designers who really know their space, they really know their users, sometimes they just use their gut and, you know, they just be like, uh, yeah, I think we should just do it this way and they put something out there and users love it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think we should get caught up in processes. And I also, I think we talked a little bit about this last night. I mean, I agree with you, it is a little bit dangerous, especially when enterprise customer companies, uh, you know, latch on to these sort of terms and then do it half passive. Um, you know, they don't, they'll follow some of it, they'll try to do some things, and then, like, all of a sudden, they'll tell their customers, oh, yeah, you know, we're doing design thinking and our software rocks, but in reality, it actually sucks. But, um, so I think, I mean, I don't think we should, I agree with you that we shouldn't get carried away with these processes and things like that. I mean, the, the whole goal of it is basically to design for the user, keeping the user in mind. So I think, you know, we can forget about the term, but just remember the fact that you should design for your user. Hi. Um, hey, uh, we have a request for your UX testing tool slide. Somebody oh. wants a copy of this, to see the slide. Yeah, again. I actually, um, I, can, I can send you the whole slide deck, and actually I have uh, four or five pages of resources. Oh, I don't know. But anyway, there are four or five slides of just resources that I use for this talk. All right, so we'll be putting that up online. Yeah, one question. Yeah. So my question is that uh, what design process, according to you, will be suitable for a product which tries to bring in some kind of behavioral change in the users? So you, you, what kind of change? You're trying to bring in new way of doing certain things. You're trying to bring in behavioral change in the users. Okay. So what uh, design process would you recommend for such kind of products? Uh, I'm not really so, sure. Okay, can I can give, give you an example. Yeah, so see, so a few years back, there was no Facebook. Right. Okay, I was yeah. hap quite happy with awkward. I yeah. was happy with the way I used to do things. But then, uh, then comes Facebook, and I got a new way of doing things. And I found it uh, quite cool, um, probably because my friends were moving to Facebook, so I also moved to Facebook. Mm -hmm. But that's not what uh, I really wanted at that point of time. So how do you design such kind of products, which tries to bring in this new way of doing things? Um, I don't know if I necessarily have an answer for that. Uh, there is like one really interesting book that I read recently, uh, actually it was an article uh, called The Fog Method of Thinking. Uh, and I think it's, it's a method that uh, Twitter and Facebook and many of these social uh, sort of networking sites uh, use a lot of. Uh, but it's a psychological type of approach to uh, design um, where basically there's a, I'm forgetting exactly the terms, but there are three different things that happen. There's a trigger, uh, there's like a reason and something else, but th the idea is that you try and segment all three into the s at the same point of time for a user. Uh, so you might want to read a little bit about those sort of things because I think uh, companies like Twitter and uh, Facebook and things like that, they, they follow a lot of these sort of um, psychological principles for design. Uh, but I myself am like not very familiar with other things about social, how social networking change behavior through design. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. I have a question. That you were suggesting, you were suggesting to escape the Photoshop entirely. Yes. So, in many companies, are having many visual designers. They all will lose their jobs. Well, that's why I suggested they should learn HTML and CSS. Then front-end developers will lose their job. What? Then front-end developers will lose no, their no, job. No, no, front-end developers should need to learn JavaScript and jQuery. 